So the federal judiciary is today's topic. And the judiciary gets its authority, is created by um, the Constitution. So Article 1, Section 3 says, the judicial power of the United States should be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. So there are a couple of ideas here. First, the main idea, this, is, this creates the federal judiciary. It starts with the Supreme Court and then Congress can add other courts, which it has. It has added appellate courts and district courts. Uh, some other good, important concept here, the judges hold their office during good behavior, which means essentially for life, or until they choose to retire, or until they're impeached, which is very, very rare. Uh, last concept this in this Article 3, Section 1, uh, that I want to mention is that their compensation shall not be diminished. So this idea is you can't lower their salary while they're in office. You can raise it, but not lower it. And this was done so they would not be punished for unpopular decisions by having their salaries lowered or removed. It goes on, section two says, the judicial power shall extend to all cases and law and equity arising under the Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made, or what shall be made under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state, claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state or the citizens thereof and foreign states, sub citizens or subjects. So this is about jurisdiction and what kinds of cases the federal courts have jurisdiction over. And the main concept here is that um, any case about the Constitution or U.S. laws, not state laws, but United States laws or treaties, those are the three main examples. There are others in that long list there, but those are the three main examples. Those are the kinds of cases that federal courts mostly deal with. So here you see a little chart or diagram of the federal court system. There are three levels to the federal court system. The lowest level is the district court, and there are 94 district courts in the United States. And these are trial courts. So a trial is almost always gonna begin here. There are rare circumstances when I guess it could begin in the Supreme Court, but it's almost always gonna be begin at one of the 94 judicial court, uh, district courts. So this is the starting point for most cases under federal statutes, the Constitution, or treaties. Then you have appellate courts in the middle, and you have 13 of them. You have 12 regional circuit courts and one U.S. Court of Appeals. And then you have one Supreme Court at the top, and it, hear, it hears appeals from the cases below. This chart has the same information, just a slightly different way of showing it. So you see the United States Court, Supreme Court at the top. But this shows how on the far left, issues can go from state courts all the way up that ladder, state trial courts, state appeals courts, state Supreme Courts, and then to the United States Supreme Court. That can happen if they're arguing the state courts, but they're arguing about a federal law or about the Constitution or a treaty. And then over towards the right, you see the 94 U.S. District Courts, so a few special federal courts. There's a tax court, for example. And there are also uh, military courts. 
and then the far right, relatively few, relatively rare, there are cases involving a foreign diplomat or state government. Yet another chart just showing the same information uh, presented a slightly different way to see which one's most, interest, most helpful for you. Jurisdiction. So uh, I already quoted the Constitution to you, but what that meant was the courts only hear cases authorized by the U.S. Constitution or by federal statutes. They hear all criminal cases brought by the federal government. Sometimes state courts and federal courts have overlapping jurisdiction. A case could be filed in state court or in federal court. There's also something called diversity jurisdiction. This allows a plaintiff of one state to file a lawsuit in federal court when a defendant is located in a different state. So if I am in Texas and I want to sue somebody who's located in Oklahoma, I can do so under diversity jurisdiction if the amount in controversy is greater than $75,000. Now, <clears throat> I told you there are 94 U.S. district courts. There are four in Texas. There's the Northern District, Western District, Southern District, and Eastern District. And in our district, the Eastern District, there are um, different courthouses. There's one in Smith County, there's one all the way down in Jefferson County, and there are others kind of sprinkled out there. There are different divisions. There are six divisions, and there are different courthouses in the different divisions. Now, there are 670 or more U.S. District Court judges nationwide, so our division can have different judges in it. Uh, there are magistrate judges who do some of the jobs in district courts, and every district court also has a bankruptcy court that specializes in just those proceedings. The Eastern District also has a district attorney, excuse me, a United States attorney. This is the chief prosecutor for the federal government, for the United States. So here in the Eastern Division where we are, the current U.S. Attorney is this guy pictured there. His name was Britt Featherston. He was appointed United States Attorney by, uh, for the Eastern District of Texas by Merrick Garland, who is the U.S. Attorney General working for uh, President Biden. So he is the Chief Federal Law Enforcement Official for the Eastern District of Texas. It's his job to bring lawsuits against criminals or to enforce the laws in this part of Texas. Now I said there are circuit courts, there are 12 regional courts, and then there's a U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. And each of these federal circuits has multiple judges. These judges are appointed by the president and they're appointed for life. They have to be approved by the Senate. Typically, a panel of three judges first hears appeals to these courts, and then, in some circumstances, the entire court, the entire circuit court, may consider certain appeals in what's called an en banc hearing. But usually, an appeal is heard by a panel of three. Um, the Fifth Circuit is the one that we're in. It includes Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. So it's down there at the bottom. And the actual court itself is located in Louisiana. And I just picked one of the many members at random to uh, tell you a little bit about. Uh, one of the more recent members of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit is James Ho. He was born in 1973 in Taiwan. You don't have to be born in the United States to be a judge. Um, and he was nominated by Donald Trump in 2017. He was confirmed by the Senate in December of 2017 and took office in January of 2018. And I kind of included his picture because 
someday you might hear his name talked about for Supreme Court nominations. If there's a Republican president, I wouldn't be surprised if his name gets floated around. This is another map just showing the different uh, appellate courts and what their boundaries are. So we're in the Fifth Circuit there at the bottom. This is a picture of the Fifth Circuit building where they meet in New Orleans. And as you can see, there are several judges, uh, a couple of dozen or more. You don't have to memorize any of those names, um, but I listed them because I found them online. That just gives you an idea of how many. But remember, only three of those at a time are going to hear an appeal. So the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit uh, is a special court. It hears appeals in cases involving patent laws and cases decided by the U.S. Court of International Trade and the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. And last, at the top, we have the U.S. Supreme Court. This is the one I want to talk the most about. So this can hear appeals on all cases brought in federal court or on cases brought in state court that deal with federal law or the Constitution. Parties to a lawsuit in a circuit court may file a writ of certiorari or a writ of cert asking the Supreme Court to hear the case. So if I am in the Fifth Circuit and I lose, I write a writ of cert asking the Supreme Court to hear my appeal, right? The U.S. Supreme Court hears fewer than 1% of the cases that are appealed to it. So your odds of making it to the Supreme Court are very, very low. And if the Supreme Court refuses to hear an appeal, then the lower court's decision stands. The court's term begins on the first Monday in October and ends in June or July. These are the nine justices on the court today. There is no formal requirement in the Constitution for there to be a certain number. So it's nine by tradition, and it's been that way since about the Civil War, about 150 years. Uh, but the Constitution doesn't specify a specific number. So the court begins its annual term on the first Monday in October. And in each term, about seven or 8,000 cases are filed in the court. That means they get, they get about seven or 8,000 writs or petitions, appeals, asking them to consider cases. They only hear, like I said, less than 1% of those. Currently, uh, typically about 80 those are decided by the Supreme Court every year. This is a lot more cases, there, there are a lot more cases appealed to the court now than there used to be. In 1950, they only received about 1,195 uh, appeals. And in 1975, only about 3,940. So they're receiving about twice as many appeals now as they did just 50 years ago but they currently only grant review in about 80 each term. Um, the publication of the court's decisions typically takes up thousands of pages every year. And during the drafting process, some of the court's opinions can be revised or changed multiple times. One thing about its jurisdiction, and I kind of hinted about this in an earlier slide, the Constitution limits the court to dealing with cases and controversies. So this phrase goes back to one of the first Supreme Court justices, or the first, John Jay. He received a request from George Washington asking him about the constitutionality of an idea. I don't remember if it was a treaty or a law that they were proposing. And John Jay responded that the Supreme Court would only hear cases and controversies. In other words, it wouldn't give advisory opinions. There has to be a real dispute between two legal, two different parties, and then it will decide a case. It'll wait until that happens. This is the phrase on the uh, building 
of the Supreme Court, equal justice under the law. And so the idea here is this is the court's ultimate responsibility to give to each party uh, the justice it deserves. And it is the final guardian and arbiter of the Constitution. I've mentioned the idea of judicial review before, but this is the court's most important power and responsibility. So this is the power to uh, invalidate either a piece of legislation or an executive action, a presidential action, that conflicts with the Constitution. So the vast majority of what they do, well, they do a lot of stuff where they're just interpreting laws. They're deciding what laws mean but some of their most controversial and important work is when they decide whether or not a law or an executive order by the president or whatever actually violates some part of the Constitution. And if it does, judicial review gives them the power to strike that law down. Now, the power of judicial review isn't explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. So nowhere in the Constitution did it say the Supreme Court will have the power to strike down congressional acts that are unconstitutional, but the founding fathers, including these two guys, Hamilton on the left, Madison on the right, both believed that judicial review was an implied power of the court, that it was the court's power to uh, stand between the legislature and the people and the Constitution and to strike down unconstitutional laws. The first case where the court actually did strike down an unconstitutional law was Marbury versus Madison. It was an 1803 case, and Chief Justice John Marshall wrote the opinion. It was an, a unanimous opinion. In the opinion, he wrote, it is emphatically the province of the judicial department to say what the law is, and the Constitution he wrote, was the fundamental law of the United States, and so it was the judiciary's obligation to decide what it meant and whether or not a congressional act opposed it. So, I've already said the court opens on the first Monday in October, and sessions last until the next summer, June or July. Uh, the court is divided into, it is either sitting or it is in recess. When it is sitting, the court hears cases and delivers opinions. When it is in recess, they have meetings privately, they write their opinions, you know, discuss and argue about them, and so forth. They have sittings and recesses in two-week intervals, so they might hear arguments for a couple of weeks and then have two weeks of recess to be you know, deliberating, arguing, writing their opinions, and then back and forth. When they are sitting and hearing oral arguments, with rare exceptions, each side is given 30 minutes to argue. So this is what the court looks like, the chambers. You'll see the nine judges sitting there and um, they will hear several cases in a given day, like four or five cases, I guess, maybe per day. And each side will get 30 minutes to argue its case. And the time goes really fast. And usually, in fact, often an argue will start, a judge will, excuse me, a lawyer will start arguing his case. He will start, the, the kind of traditional beginning is, may it please the court. And then he will start to say, or she will start to say, Your Honors, we believe this, this, and that. Often the judges will interrupt the lawyer before the first sentence is over and start asking questions. They'll say, well, what do you think about this argument? What do you think about that argument? Why do you think this is unconstitutional? And the lawyer has to be really fast on his or her feet and be able to answer all of those questions. Uh, they're recorded, but there are no photographs. I'll talk about that more in a second. There's no jury and there's no witnesses because they don't argue about facts, right? You're never arguing about whether or not somebody did something or whether or not somebody's guilty. You're arguing about the law 
and what the law, how it should be interpreted. Um, this is one of only two pictures of the U.S. Supreme Court in action. It was taken about 90 years ago by a German photographer. Uh, it was then and is now forbidden to take pictures inside the Supreme Court. So he snuck a camera in. He faked that he had a broken arm and hid the camera inside his sling and took a picture while he was uh, observing the session. The public can watch the sessions. It's just they're not allowed to take photographs. So when the court is sitting, the sessions usually begin at 10 a.m. Uh, there are no sessions on Thursdays or Fridays. Uh, there's a typical kind of traditional entrance when the court, the judges come in at 10. Um, the court bailiff, or whatever you call them, will say the Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States, Oyez, 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 all persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting, God save the United States and this honorable court. It's the court marshal who says that at 10 a.m. So the court hears oral arguments, it transacts other business. Um, And then in May and June, it usually announces its opinions and its orders. And at the end of June, it usually recesses, but the judges continue to work. They just work privately in their chambers. This is another picture. This is the second picture in existence photograph of the Supreme Court in action. This is from 1937. Here, a woman put a camera in her purse and cut a hole in the purse and managed to take a photograph through the hole, and then it was published in a newspaper afterwards, Time magazine. Um, in 1946, Federal Rule 53 was enacted, and it says, except as otherwise provided by statute or these rules, the court must not permit the taking of photographs in the courtroom during judicial proceedings or the broadcasting of judicial proceedings from the courtroom. So that was a little bit about the procedure, the time schedule and so forth. I want to tell you briefly just an overview, a recap of 10 of the more interesting decisions that were passed that were issued by the Supreme Court this year. You've almost certainly heard of one of them. You may have heard of more than one. So it'll give you a glimpse of the wide variety of things the court has to deal with, issues all across the political spectrum. So the first one is about immigration, illegal immigration in particular. So, well, no asylum seeking, I should have said. Uh, I should have said. So the case is called Biden versus Texas. And under the previous administration, the US Department of Homeland Security required that people who were not citizens of the United States, who were crossing from Mexico into the United States and appealing for asylum, right, claiming that they were asylum seekers, had to wait in Mexico while their case was being processed. Right? So they could appeal for asylum, but they had to wait on the other side of the line, of the border. Under the new administration, the Biden administration, issued an order ending that program and saying you could come on into the United States, appeal for asylum, and wait here while you were, your case was being decided. So several states, including I think Texas, sued the administration saying that it uh, had violated the law in re ending the Remain in Mexico program. Now, what the court was deciding was actually kind of arcane they weren't deciding whether or not they like the Remain in Mexico program, the idea of making them wait on the other side of the border. What they were deciding was whether or not the Biden administration had given sufficient reasons for changing the program. It couldn't be arbitrary. 
they had to explain why they were doing it. And by a five to four decision, they sided with the Biden administration. So the court allowed the administration to end the Remain in Mexico program. This case involved Indian reservations and it came out of Oklahoma. So it's called Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta. So a defendant in a criminal case was a non-Indian. He committed a crime allegedly against an Indian on Indian land, on a reservation. The state of Oklahoma wanted to pursue criminal charges against the defendant. The defendant said the state cannot prosecute him because the crime occurred on Indian land and so only the federal government can prosecute him. So the court here ruled with the state of Oklahoma. A narrow decision, five to four. Notice five out of the six conservatives, Republican appointees, uh, voted with the state. The three liberal or Democrat appointees sided with the Indian reservation. So it ruled that state authorities may prosecute non-Indians who commit crimes against Indians on reservations. Another case involved school prayer. This was a somewhat controversial case. You might have heard something about it in the news. So, um, <clears throat> there was a football coach at a public high school in the Northwest, it was Washington or Oregon, and he wanted to pray, he was holding voluntary prayers with his players after football games at the 50 yard line. The school district told him to stop and he refused and then they suspended him and then the case went into court. So the question was, did the school district have the right to suspend him or did they violate his first amendment rights to free exercise of religion? So the court ruled in favor of the coach, six to three. So he did have a constitutional right to hold these voluntary prayers at the 50 yard line. This is the one you've probably all heard of, even if you don't know the name of it. Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization was about a Mississippi law that banned abortions after 15 weeks, with some exceptions. So, Previous cases like Roe versus Wade had said, had limited, severely limited uh, the power of states to regulate abortion. This case overturned Roe versus Wade. It basically sent abortion regulation back to the states and said it's not a matter of the US Constitution. There is no US constitutional right to an abortion, so states can regulate however they want. This is a Second Amendment case. So New York required a person to show a need for self-protection in order to receive a license to carry a concealed firearm outside the home. So you had to apply for the license and show New York that you needed it to protect yourself and uh, Bruin, whoever Bruin was, argued that this violated his Second Amendment right to bear arms. And in a 6-3 to three decision, the court agreed with him. So the New York rule was unconstitutional. This is another freedom of religion uh, First Amendment case. Carson versus Macon came out of Maine. So the state of Maine had a program. They paid private school tuition for students in rural areas that do not have public secondary schools, but, pro, but Maine prohibited students from using this public money to attend, to attend schools that were religious. And the argument by the people suing Maine was that this violated their right to freedom of religion. Supreme Court agreed six to three that Maine did violate 
the free exercise of religion. So the idea was, if they were offering this assistance to private schools, because there was no public school in the area, then they shouldn't discriminate against the private schools that happened to be religious. It had to include all private schools. Shirtless, shirtless versus Boston. This is a First Amendment case again. Here, the city of Boston often flew flags of different organizations in front of its city hall, but it refused to fly a flag from an organization that, that had a Christian cross on it. And so Shirtlift sued Boston, said this violates the First Amendment, free exercise of religion. If you allow other people to fly their organization's flags, you have to fly mine as well. The court agreed nine to zero. So this was a rare case. Well, I don't know if it was rare, um, but I guess slightly unusual. Every single member of the court agreed. Shirtliff was right. Boston, the city of Boston was wrong, and they had to fly his flag as well, or his organization's flag. This was an interesting case out of Texas. So Texas law barred a death row inmate from having his pastor in the chamber during his execution and placing his hands on him while praying out loud. So Texas didn't want to let the pastor in the room while the execution was taking place. And the inmate was saying, I want him to be able to put his hands on me and pray for me in the room where it's going to happen. And he won. There was only one dissent, Justice Thomas. All the others agreed that his constitutional right to freedom of religion allowed him to have the pastor inside the room. This case, Zubadai, United States versus Zubadai, had to do with Guantanamo Bay. So if you know way back after the September 11 attacks 21 years ago, Guantanamo Bay was set up for detainees suspected terrorists captured abroad, and there are still some people being held there. So a terrorism suspect being held there said that the CIA used enhanced interrogation techniques, in other words, torture, and wanted it investigated. The government had declassified some of the information, but the government claimed it had a right to protect state, state secrets in the name of national security and was not provided to hand over all the evidence. So the court agreed with the United States, not the detainee, seven to two. The US was not required to disclose the location of the CIA black site where the detainee had been allegedly tortured. A black site meant basically a secret location in some other country, Eastern Europe, Africa, wherever, where these interrogations took place. COVID was a big deal and a big source of litigation. And the last two cases deal with it. So here, the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration issued a rule mandating that all employees with at least 100, excuse me, employers with at least 100 employees require that their employees either be vaccinated against COVID-19 or else be tested weekly and wear masks at work. And some people thought that this mandate exceeded the government's authority. So if you have 100 or more employees, a requirement for vaccination. Um, here, the National Federation of Independent Business won. The justices agreed six to three that the government, the Biden administration, could not force them to get vaccinated. But here you have a slightly different result. In Biden versus Missouri, the court found that the Biden administration's mandate to require healthcare workers at facilities receiving federal money to be vaccinated was lawful. So it's a slightly different set of circumstances. Here, the requirement was that healthcare workers at hospitals 
and other facilities participating in Medicare and Medicaid, those are federal health programs, be vaccinated against COVID-19 unless they qualified for religious or medical exemptions. And five to four, the court upheld the rule, so this time it sided with the Biden administration. That was a lawful exercise of its powers. This is basically a mandate. I talked about those, uh, I think, well, no, I didn't. I didn't talk about mandates the other day. Maybe I will later down the road. Okay, that's it for today.